session at 7.28. All trustees are uh, present. Thank you all for giving us a, a quick break. And um, we will move on to our moment of silence and our pledges of allegiance. So at this time, the Great Vine Colleyville Independent School District, Board of Trustees and Central Administration, we will pause for a moment of silence to reflect on the safety and the well-being of our students, teachers, and our community while they enjoy their summer. Thank you, guys. We will now move uh, to our pledges and uh, believe we've been a flag behind Dr. Schnauz. And um, Mindy is going to lead us in our pledges. And remember to unmute. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I pledge allegiance to the flag the United States of America. And, and to the Republic, which it constitutes one nation, nation indivisible, indivisible, liberty, 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 and justice yeah. for all. Oh. Okay. And the Texas flag. Honor the Texas, Texas flag. flag. I pledge allegiance to, to the Texas, Texas. One, state one state under God. Under God. One, one indivisible. indivisible. Thank you, Mindy. We'll move on to our monthly LEAP 2.0 highlight. Dr. Ryan. Yes, we do have a, a lead 2.0 highlight that I think is very timely uh, for our school district. And uh, so I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Schnauz for an introduction. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ryan. So uh, we're very blessed here in GCISD to have some amazing extracurricular opportunities uh, for, for all students uh, uh, from elementary to secondary. We have coaches, directors, sponsors, teachers that just love our kids, that just pour into them, invest in their lives and really just set them up for success for the rest of their lives when, when they leave here in GCISD. And so uh, tonight's uh, LEAD 2.0 highlight is really around that. It's around the impact that those extracurriculars have uh, on our students. Uh, it's it's focused on kind of how we closed out the spring uh, with the COVID and this, and this COVID pandemic, uh, but really it's looking forward to kind of now that strength and conditioning has started for many of our student athletes, at the secondary level uh, to what it may look like when our, our fine arts kids, when our band comes back. And so we have Brian Gerlich here with us tonight. We have David Zarnt, we have Coach Alexander and Coach Martin with us uh, to just talk about kind of uh, how the spring ended, but then kind of the look ahead and, and what's to come. So who am I turning it over to, Brian or, or DZ? That would be me, sir. David Zarnt. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity. Dr. Ryan, members of the board, it's good to be with you tonight. I'm going to very quickly share my screen and we will talk a little bit. And can I see my PowerPoint? Yes, sir. You're good. Perfect. Thank you, sir. So, um, again, appreciate the opportunity tonight to to talk a little bit about lead 2.0 and specifically goal 2 and thinking about social and emotional learning. I know you guys were just talking about that. So um, that's been a big part of what we've been doing um, throughout the spring and as we move into the uh, summer and fall months. So I uh, want to just share with you um, that talking about lead. 2.0 and goal two and, and designing learning environments. We're looking specifically from my end about five pillars, uh, self awareness, social awareness, responsible decision making, self management and relationship skills. And so when the buildings closed, we had to work really quickly to design a, a new learning environment in a very short time span. So we started by looking through that that social emotional lens and just started with this question. Are you okay? 
focusing on students um, and their well-being in a time of, of a lot of upheaval and uncertainty. So asking them that question and then just seeing, you know, being willing to listen uh, as to what's going on in their world. And then as the closure continued, uh, we began to really focus on maintaining relationships with students. And for us, a really big one, the relationship between students. So what did we do? We had regular check ins um, with our, our folks via video to discuss the work that they're doing and any concerns. Uh, we had multiple meetings throughout the week to make sure that we catch everybody because we know in the asynchronous environment, sometimes kids would be in another class, an AP class or something like that. So multiple meetings to be able to see everybody. Um, we had lunch bunch meetings. If you're you're familiar with our fine arts spaces in the buildings, band halls, choir rooms, um, art rooms, kids typically migrate there for lunch because that's their favorite place to be in the building. So we wanted to recreate that safe space for them virtually. So we would open up a meeting for 45 minutes and eat lunch together and just talk and and again, just working on that that social emotional wellness. There were a lot of home visits, especially for our seniors, and we're all aware of, of how much this affected our senior class with the, the things that they lost. And we wanted to make sure that they continued to feel connected and valued um, their contributions and their work over the last four years. And then finally, in our online learning, we wanted to make sure that we, we had an outlet for expression and, and creating because those things didn't stop when we closed the classroom door. So you saw a lot of this stuff on Twitter and Facebook, the living room recital, um, little kids playing their recorder for mom and dad in the living room. This is my new favorite, the laundry room art gallery, laundry art, where students would take laundry and arrange it in the floor to create a mosaic type art piece. And that's been a, a really cool thing that we've seen. A little bit more outside of the box thinking in terms of creative spaces um, our theater folks at the high school and the middle school both were able to reach out to several playwrights and seek permission to live stream performances so we had some virtual theater performances at the end of the year this is a very cool and a very unique thing to be able to to cap our year and have a, a capstone type project for those classes and then as we, we finally did wind down, uh, we had a lot of virtual end of year banquets um, that really kind of rivaled our, our in person banquets. Kids would get dressed up and log in and it was a really neat thing to see. And now as our um, our social distancing guidelines are relaxing a little bit, we've had a few drive in banquets. I think you may have seen on on social media, the Colleyville Heritage Band sitting in the parking lot, social distancing, but watching their state marching band performance one more time. and and just being able to connect again, focusing on that social emotional lens of relationship skills. So what's coming up for us? What's next? Um, we have UIL and TEA guidelines for practice, and we anticipate more updates to that as we move through the summer. I will tell you right now, we are all continuing from the fine arts side, continuing to have virtual practices. June is typically our slow month. Uh, we're preparing for multiple outcomes, though, as we move into July and our practices ramp up and we're making sure that we're able to function if there's reduced capacity in the spaces going as far as looking at marching band and having multiple uh, shows designed to be able to deal with if we have a reduced instrumentation or those type of things. We're going to continue to focus instruction through that social emotional lens, specifically look for building relationship skills and then responsible decision making in this virtual environment there's a lot of opportunity for students to have really good um, decision making skills you know just starting as simply as waking up and getting logged in on time to making sure that we're in the right place at the right time to to make sure that we're logged into those synchronous classes so we want to continue to focus on those but our big um, challenge and our big opportunity for the fall is changing the how and not the what, meaning we're gonna keep the excellence that our programs are known for. We may have to adjust the curriculum. We know that, we accept that, and the smaller class sizes, those type of things, but we're not gonna adjust the expectation and the rigor for our kids. And we're gonna continue to view things through that lens of social emotional learning, as this is where our programs excelled when we were in the buildings, and we know that's where our programs are gonna excel even outside the building. So that's what's going on with fine arts. And with that, I will turn it over to our executive director of athletics, Mr. Garlic. We got you unmuted on this side, Brian. See if you can.
I'm going to try to move you back and bring you back over, Brian, and see if that helps. You try now, Brian? Go find you. Hey, Zarn, why don't we go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and go to the coaches. That's it. I believe our first coach up is Mike Alexander. You hear us, Mike? I got you. All uh, right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Zart. Uh, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Snout's board, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be here. Uh, you know, I think uh, I want to just, just lead off by saying that, uh, you know, when, when, when this all went down and, uh, you know, and our, our coaches had to kind of pivot and shift gears from being face-to-face, uh, the things that they've done over the last three months have just amazed me. You know, I think that, and I firmly believe this, there's not a staff in the state of Texas or the United States, collegiate on down, that's done a better job serving kids where they are, meeting their needs uh, than our guys have over the last three months. And I'm, I'm just going to go through this and just tell you a little bit about what we've been doing for the last three months. And uh, I could probably talk a lot longer than what, what uh, Coach Gerlich wants me to, so I'll keep it as brief as possible. But, uh, you know, um, when this all went down, um, you know, and, and kids couldn't come back to school, obviously the social-emotional wellness piece was a, was a huge factor. And uh, so what I'm going to share with you is, is how what we've done and how we see it through the lens of uh, Dr. Ryan's uh, vision for, for GCISD and keeping, uh, you know, our, our – our core values of purpose and innovation and community and everything that we've done over the last three months can be filtered through that. And so let's go back to March 13th, you know, and governor Abbott sends us home and says, you can't come back to school for two weeks and we're going to flatten the curve and all that stuff. And, and, uh, and I knew that our guys were coming off of a uh, one week uh, spring break. So they're about to have th a three week vacation and, and, you know, knowing high school kids the way we all know high school kids, they needed, they needed some encouragement. So every morning I'd wake them up at eight o'clock and, uh, and I'd shoot a one minute video and I'd, I'd uh, send it in remind and, and I just encourage them to be productive and to grow personally that day. And, and we used our Mustang men leadership uh, curriculum to, to pull things from there and, and challenge them on a daily basis just to keep growing as a, as a human. And, uh, and I think that was, that was good for the first week. And then, then we got the word that we weren't going to come back to school till April, April 24th. And, and our purpose changed a little bit. We started to target more the physical development because we knew these are these are athletes, these are football players. They're they're not going to be well if they're sitting around and not being active. So uh, so I got you know I I decided well I got to get educated on on being innovative and what can we do virtually or what can we do to push out workouts where we're not sitting there over the top of them watching them work out. So we found some some really cool online platforms. I invested in it. And uh, we became we began to compete with each other, and and uh, kids were able to log workouts and post workouts that they were doing, and and we were able to to give rewards each week just to keep them active and to keep them motivated to be active, and and the types of things that athletes, student athletes, do on a daily basis. And then uh, you know want to give a shout out to our athletic trainer Tiffany Phillips. Uh, she uh, she recognized that there was a piece missing from their their mobility side and their flexibility, and she started doing uh, biweekly WebExes, and uh, she she brought the boys in and and girls too for that matter. It was open to all GHS athletes, and and she started meeting with them in a WebEx setting live, where she would take them through what we call Mustang mobility, and that's just our, that's our word for yoga. But it's uh, you know that's something also that can speak to their to their social wellness and being connected in a live WebEx where they can do something physically and, um, and, and, and fellowship in that way was, was important. Um, not long after that, we realized, well, heck, we're not going back to school. And it was devastating. And everybody remembers that day and, and for the baseball teams and the softball teams and the track teams and everything. And, and then for our guys and in, in my world, our, our spring football was shot. We weren't going to be able to have spring football. And that's a big deal to a lot of guys 
um, you know, and uh, that are looking to try and earn a college scholarship and different things like that. And, and so uh, we rallied the troops and I got the coaches together and we decided we're going to do spring football. We're going to do it virtually. And so every coach got his position group and created their own Google classroom. And, um, and so we started meeting with our players, um, our position coaches meet with their players twice a week. And then I would meet with them in a bigger setting or larger setting, a theme setting once a week. And our coaches would sit down with these guys and they would take time to the first 10 minutes of every session. And they would just, uh, they would just, basically uh, meet them where they were emotionally and talk to and talk through things with them about where they, you know, what's going on at their house. Are there any needs that they need met? We got to know each other on a little different level relationally than, than maybe we even would have, you know, in a one-to-one -one setting, um, you know, uh, in school. And so, so that was good. And then we spent the rest of the time teaching them football and they did a tremendous job and you'd be so proud of our coaches and the, and the effort that they put in to be um, really, really intentional and uh, build lessons uh, that pertain to football and quizzes and tests that pertain to football. And, uh, and our kids bought into it. And then uh, we did that and we were in the middle of the month of May. And I realized about two weeks into May that there were a couple things still missing. And we were missing the community aspect. We were missing our Mustang Serving Others program where we get to go out and, and serve our community. And so we, uh, we created a food drive. I partnered with, uh, or we partnered with 121 Church and um, we adopted our football program, adopted 25 families who live right here in our community on Mustang Drive. And we uh, raised enough food to feed them for a month. And then we had even more left over. And we took that leftover food and stocked the Grace Pantry. And uh, that was something that, you know, that was right when Governor Abbott started lifting some restrictions and people were able to get out and move around and kids were able to come up and, and serve and, and help with each and help uh, their community out. And that was huge. And then, um, and then the last thing we realized we were missing was our rising ninth graders. And uh, I want to, you know, we never had to, or I've never had the chance to address, uh, you know, this on a on a scale like this. But I want our board to know how big a deal it is that you guys allow us to bring over our rising ninth graders the month of April and May to to come to our campus and get integrated in our uh, athletics and and get to know all the kids from the different middle schools that they don't that they didn't know previously, and just to become one Mustang and and uh, we missed all that, but, you know, I decided we're going to do it anyway. And so we called the middle school coordinators and got all the list of all the kids that played football last year. And, and I created a, one, a four minute video and I sent it to their parents. And it was just a video welcoming them to the Mustang football family and, and uh, let them know that we're, you know, we, we hadn't forgot about them and that we're excited to get to coach them. We don't know when that was going to be, but, but when it, when it, when it happens that we wanted them to be a part of us and, and then we created a, a freshman Google Classroom, a rising ninth grader Google Classroom, and we started meeting with those guys twice a week. So our coaches were really, really busy, and, um, and it's paid huge dividends. Now we're getting to do strength and conditioning on a daily basis, and, and all those freshmen that didn't know anything about our system, and, and now they're, they're, they're showing up to football, and they're, they're already putting to work and putting into practice the things that we taught them back in the month of May. And, and um, you know, it, it's – it just shows us right now where we are with this, uh, you know, at home stuff and at home learning that we may have to do it for a period of time, but, uh, but we were designed for community and we were designed to be together. And, and uh, no matter if we're doing it from home or we're doing it in the schoolhouse, a coach's, uh, a coach's role in a, in a young person's life is vital. And, um, you know, many of our students, uh, you know, they, they lean on our coaches heavily. We found out as coaches that we lean on our students heavily too through this. And so uh, we're excited that we're getting the chance to do strength and conditioning right now. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, we're, we appreciate all the work it, with, uh, with all the different teams that are putting together all these tentative plans and things. But, you know, we're still hopeful that we're going to get to play, uh, play a football season and, and have a cross country season and, and do all the spring sports that, that we're accustomed to doing. And, and um, anyway, that's what's been going on at Grapevine High School. Uh, we didn't slow down a bit. We just uh, put, the, put the pedal down to the metal and uh, kept, kept on rolling. So uh, I'll be quiet and I'll let Kurt talk right now. But uh, thank you for the opportunity and, uh, and know that, uh, that our coach is here, still here to serve kids. All right, Mike, can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. 
Well, I think we had 13 minutes, so I just need to tell y'all, hey, thanks for having us, and that was awesome. And, and <laughs> that that's a tough act to follow right there. Um, aw- awesome job, you know, uh, uh, Mike and his his crew do over there. Well, what's happened in the spring is is you guys hired me, and and then we went on break, you know. So I got to meet our kids twice um, um, before you know all this hit, and. Uh, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just, I want to thank y'all first of all for 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 having me and hiring me, and um, our, our staff has, too has been, you know, uh, extremely busy with, you know, the virtual meetings with their kids, you know, position group meetings, and and uh, you know, overall, you know, offensive meetings, and defensive meetings, and then and then just me meeting with the whole team. But it's it's been great. Um, you know, we we when when things loosened up a little bit, we had a Gatorade parade where. We went to to each kid's house and had them come to the curb, and we, you know, gave those guys Gatorade and, and that kind of stuff, and and that was awesome. Um, you know, the virtual meetings have been great. Um, we we've, you know, you know, had a couple of home visits, you know, with with guys that, uh, you know, we we had concerns about, and um, you know, so all that all that's been great. Um, you know, we're we're into the the summer program now, and and you know, it's. In my in my mind, it's it's kind of the first test to see you know if if we can you know do this thing again. So you know every school in the t- state of Texas is is having you know these summer um, strength conditioning workouts and and man it, it's been awesome for me because I, I didn't know the kid you know I I get to be with our kids every day and get to know them and share my heart with them. We start every day with you know I I launch them with you know our theme is be different. And uh, I, I don't want to be like everybody else. I want our kids to be different, treat people differently, um, you know, be a true brotherhood, you know, be a true teammate, be my brother's keeper, all those things. So we're, we're, we've launched that and our kids have really, uh, you know, taken to it. I, I think uh, excited about it. They're excited about their season. You know, they were hungry, you know, to be around other humans and uh, as were our coaches. And so our attendance has been excellent. I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying like 98, 99%. Um, you know, of, of, of our kids are, are there, you know, and so that's been really awesome and getting to know these kids and, and to know their work ethic and, and, you know, to, to be able to, you know, see, you know, what an awesome, you know, district this is and what, what a great school, you know, Collegeville Heritage is and, and, and meet with other coaches and other coaches from other sports. And it, it's been awesome for me because, you know, it, it's all new and, and learning and, and all that stuff, but, you know, been, been very proud of our kids and what they've done and, and, and our coaches, you know, safety has been first, you know, and paramount. And so, you know, we, we take the temperature of every kid and every coach, every human that walks through the doors gets their temperature taken and, and anybody over 100.1, you know, has to go home. We haven't had anybody yet. You know, we've, we've had uh, one kid um, that, uh, you know, that, that had fever the night before and and obviously we we've told anybody that feels sick at all to, to stay home this is voluntary you know they're not they're not required to be here but man they want to be here and and the kid that i made stay home was begging me and i said no sir well i said go to the doctor and, and figure that thing out so um it it was uh it was uh it wasn't even strep they tested him for strep and that wasn't he was you know in two days he was 100 percent ready to go so so we're being safe and, and doing it the right way because i think this is a test run and, and uh you know i think if if all over the state we don't have issues with this you know hopefully we'll be get be able to get back to some sense of normalcy and and uh you know have have kiddos in the school building you know when when the fall rolls around and get to have our our seasons of, of, you know, um, extracurriculars and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, it's it's been really awesome. I, I think uh, our, our staff is is complete now and and, uh, you know, we're getting getting close to, you know, having everything up and running as far as, you know, me coaching up the coaches. And, you know, we had virtual meetings with the kids, but I also had to have virtual meetings with all of our coaches and and get them uh, in tune with with my vision and, and what I want and um, you know we we want to love bigger and and uh, and be better and so um, I'm excited I think we have a really good football team all of our athletics are are, are really strong as you guys already know um, I, I'm I'm new to this uh, you know school and stuff like that but and I'm fired up for what we have and and uh, I'm excited to to go out and, and be different this next year.
Pardon, I believe Mr. Gerlich wants to wrap up. Do we have Mr. Gerlich now? Doesn't doesn't sound like we got any sound from Mr. Gerlich. Okay, well then and wrap up for him. Um, just looking at UIL and TEA guidelines for uh, strength and conditioning, UIL and um, TEA did update those um, guidelines this last week for non-UIL sports, and that was a, a big help for uh, all the folks outside football as well as drill teams since that's a non-UIL activity. So we have a little bit better guidance as to how we can bring um, those, those other kiddos back into the fold as we continue to work through the summer. And again, we expect those guidelines to continue to be updated as we close in on um, the month of August and things start to really ramp up. Um, across the board, I, I think this goes for athletics as well as fine arts. We're going to continue to focus on our social emotional learning and, and making sure that, quite honestly, we're taking care of kids. Um, that's that's priority number one, making sure they that they feel okay that they feel safe in the learning environment that they feel safe and in being with us and making sure that uh, we are continuing to build those relationships both um, with our folks um, teacher wise as well as student to student and then again i know on the athletic side we're also planning for multiple outcomes depending on what happens as we move through the the spring and the course of the virus so um, this is what we've always done. And when the buildings were open, this is what we, we were, were great at. And as the buildings have closed, this is what we've been great at. And we're going to continue to do that. Uh, and again, we're going to change the, the uh, how and not the what. We're going to look a little bit different, but the goals are going to remain the same. And that's, that's really, again, focusing on students and making sure that that social emotional piece is uh, well taken care of because we know they're going to come back to us with a lot of things on their plate and we're going to make sure that they're taken care of. So with that, I will stop my share. Ask if there are any questions I can answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. It's just so wonderful for us to see what y'all are doing that we're not aware of and how you're reaching out to the students. It's just amazing how, what work y'all are, y'all are doing to make sure that um, you stay connected. So thank you very much to all of y'all for just a wonderful presentation. Uh, do we have any questions from, I'm not able to see, hang on. Slowly bringing everybody up. Do we have any questions from the trustees? Slowly bring in. There we go. Do I have any questions from any trustee? No? Oh, well, I do. Becky? Yeah, so I'm curious um, how are our extracurricular activities, especially now that they're able to start doing some things, how are y'all communicating to not only to the students, but also to the parents? as to what the guidelines and um, restrictions um, should be as kids are coming together more. Um, and especially like to the point of the kid that was running a fever and had to go, you know, at least get that checked out. Um, <clears throat> that's been a concern that I've heard actually from parents, not specifically about extracurriculars, but more about, um, you know, they're not being a punitive approach to absences, but but really going back to that first question, how are y'all communicating? Because right now, right, they're not even they're not required to be there. This is all optional anyway. But how are y'all communicating out to parents? Um, you know what? How the kids are being kept safe and what the kids what the expectations are when the kids are are in an activity. I, I can I can speak to that. Um, you know, we, we had an online um, sign up. So what we did is we had a launch pad that listed every UIL requirement for us to follow, you know, COVID protocol. And and there was a questionnaire in there that, that the parents, you know, had to sign off on. And we had to have that before any kid, you know, participated. And it, and it, it detailed exactly what we had to have. And and, you know, it's it's the, you know, 
the coach to student ratio, you know, the social distancing part. And, you know, if, if a kid, you know, was, uh, you know, came up what, what the protocol would be for that. So all that information was given at the front end and, you know, they knew what they were signing up for prior to, and they knew what our, you know, you know, we, it, it's been awesome. And every Monday, that same questionnaire goes out again before they can, before they can enter our building, they have, that has to be signed with a parent signature. So, you know, and if they don't do it online, then they have to do it at the door. So Monday is about 15, 20, maybe 25 minutes longer just because of the registration process. It's, it's like a, a re-registration every Monday for us. So, so that's, that's been, you know, that's been good. And, and like I said, you know, just the temp part, you know, to catch them before they come in the door, you know, they may be asymptomatic and we don't know it, but somebody with true symptoms, we're going to catch and, and they have, there's, there's symptoms questions on that questionnaire that they have to fill out. And, and so um, it's been awesome. And we have the same people at the desk every time, you know, there's, there's hand sanitizers, there's masks, you know, there's, there's gloves, you know, there's no shared water. There's lots of different, um, you know, specific requirements and guidelines that we're following and, and the kids are doing a good job. It's different, you know, and the hardest part was that first day, you know, I, I was afraid, you know, I was going to get shut down because my building is right across, you know, from the, from the athletic director's office and those kids were all bunched up, you know, and we spent the, you know, most part of the day, hey, spread out, spread out, spread out, you know, so we had, they come in the same door and go out the same door, you know, there, there's no intermingling, the other athletes from other sports, they come in the opposite, you know, side of the road now, so there's, there's, I mean, it's been great, you know, so far we haven't had any issues, and, and it's my goal that we don't, so that we can have school in the building someday, so um, I, I think this is kind of a, a trial run, so I think it's been good. Hopefully that answered those questions. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that perspective, Coach. Thank you. I, I think that's that's actually a great point that this is an opportunity for kids to kind of, you know, get their feet wet with what the expectations could very well be in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Any other questions before we move on? Jesse? Yeah, and, and again, this is not a question, but I want Coaches, in terms of focus and the importance that y'all placed on the well being, social emotional well being. Uh, and I addressed it earlier during our workshop that that's an area that I feel is extremely critical and we need to continually monitor in terms of how our students are doing, as well as our, as I said it earlier, teachers and administrators, coaches in this case. I guess my only question is, and I think I saw it, but please, um, please make sure that I saw this correctly. And this is something that you all are both planning to continue as we uh, go into this next uh, school year, regardless of indeed what we're doing and how we're doing it. But this is still going to be a focus, correct? Um, yeah, yes, sir, Mr. Rodriguez. Uh, you know, it's not it's not a focus as much as it's it's how we coach. It's is this is that's what being a coach is about. You know, I mean, I don't I wouldn't know. Wouldn't know any way else to do it, any any other way to do it, and I wouldn't hire anybody that that wasn't like minded. And I know Kirk feels the same way. Um, you know, we're going to hire good guys and good ladies to to coach our kids that that you know care about the kid, the whole child more than more than the wins and the losses. And uh, and so you know, your your uh, our students are in good hands with uh, with both our staffs. I believe that. Well, thank you. Excellent answer. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'll speak to that real quickly. A 20 second answer or more. You know, every every coach that, that we hire, you know, we can teach them what to do. If they don't love kids, then, then they can't work here, you know. And that's, I mean, that's just honest, pure heart that if, if you don't have a true passion for kids and you're trying to make a difference in their lives, then, man, you're in the wrong business. So um, that's, you know, I, 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 Mike, and I know he feels the same way and, and, and I strive to be like him, you know, but great staffs and, and we're going to love kids. Well, thank you both. Appreciate that. Any other questions? Nope. Thank you all again. And Mr. Zarn, thank you uh, as well. And I know the, the, well, where did you go?
There you are. Um, I know the kids are just as excited about getting on the field as they are about getting out there and practicing their routines and band. Just, yes, it's so important for the kids to come together. And I know all the, the students are ready to get back to some kind of normal. So thank you also for the fine arts and uh, thank you both gentlemen for the, for the sports update. We thank appreciate you. it all very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. We will move on to recognitions, Dr. Ryan. Yes, thank you. We have uh, a couple of recognitions tonight. Um, our first recognition this evening is for uh, Caroline Gao and Ashwin Kata, uh, two students at Colorado Heritage who have achieved uh, something very, very special. They have earned a perfect score on the ACT, both of them. Um, and I'm hoping that they're still with us tonight. Caroline is, uh, she's in choir, uh, Caroline's in choir, Science Olympiad, Red Jackets, and Pals. Ashwin's involved in Science Olympiad, uh, the Chem Club, and the Earth Club. Uh, but uh, what an amazing thing to have a perfect score on the ACT. Uh, Kyle, do we have? We have Ashwin, Ashwin on. Uh, looks like we're having trouble with Caroline coming on but she is in the audience. Oh, well, we're just gonna have to say really nice things about her. Ashwin, I, I, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being patient. I know that took a while, but uh, uh, just want to uh, say congratulations to you. Um, is there anything that you would like to say uh, to this group uh, as the person with a perfect score on the ACT? Uh, I mean, I don't really know if uh, perfect score in the ACT gives me like the justification to talk about anything, but I just want to thank everyone for like having me here. Uh, it's uh, definitely an honor to be here. Well, thank you for joining us. And we know that your teachers are so proud of you. Uh, and that, uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in GCISD? When did you, uh, where, have you been here since elementary school or when did you join us? Uh, I moved, so I used to live in Chicago for like my early elementary school years, and I moved here in about third grade to a HES, uh, Heritage Elementary School. Right. And I moved around a little bit, transferred to Bear Creek Elementary School, went back to HMS, had a great time there, then came to Colleyville Heritage, and that's where I've been ever since. Well, uh, again, um, uh, now you're a junior? Yeah, I'm a junior. Okay, so uh, what are you thinking about for plans after your senior year? uh well i mean obviously college admissions right and uh there's a lot riding on my college admissions my parents really have like high hopes in me and i'm not sure if i have the uh not like the potential or anything but uh, i think their expectations are a little too high than what i'm really comfortable putting myself at but uh yeah it really depends on where i get into and where i end up going well, I'd say with the perfect ACT score, you're kind of on the right track, Ashwin. I, I'd say uh, I'd say you're doing the right things that you need to do to put yourself in a position to really go anywhere you want to go. And we just want to say thank you for your dedication, uh, as well as Caroline. We know that you have to be dedicated. This kind of thing just doesn't come uh, without a lot of work. And so um, congratulations again. Thank you for joining us and good luck as a senior next year. Thank you. All right, our next recognition is for a state championship. Uh, the Colorado Heritage High School eSports team added to an already successful 19 and 20 school year with a second straight League of Legends Texas state championship. The Panthers won the inaugural state championship in the fall and then made it a sweep of the school year uh, with a win over Allen High School in the spring 2020 championship. Um, uh, the team competed through the year against other Texas high school esports teams. And uh, of course, the program was established in 2018 with over 75 students competing in the first year. And since that time, the growth of the program has doubled in students wanting to participate. Esports is a way to expand, <coughs> expand the opportunity for extracurricular activities to all students within GCIC. In the first year alone, the program discovered that 70% of its students in esports didn't participate in any other campus activity. So it's a way to get kids involved in the school and not only involved, but really excelling and bringing uh, um, uh, championships to the school. So the power of esports and the GCISD program goes beyond uh, just industry, uh, just the games. In other words, uh, the program is one that's preparing students for a growing industry as well as focusing on skills such as communication, 
collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. As I have observed esports, I've seen all of those skills in practice, uh, and it's just amazing, especially the communication and collaboration, uh, uh, and and uh, and it's just an amazing thing to watch our teams work. So joining us tonight are Ji Ho Lee and Jonathan Shu and Coach David Perello. Welcome and congratulations on your second straight championship. Coach Perello, tell us a little bit about your eSports state, uh, second state championship. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, super thankful for, for Kyle and the support he's given us and Dr. Ryan, obviously yourself. Um, the kids had a, had a great time. Um, I'm really proud of them. They worked hard. You know, it was easy for us to keep keep playing the game, uh, obviously, with the closure, but we still stayed in touch and uh, just proud of them. Seniors won once two, two uh, state championships, and it was it was a good deal. Thank you. Can you introduce uh, your two players and allow them to, uh, to say a little bit to us? A absolutely. So Jonathan actually joined us this year, and uh, he has been a great addition. He first year on the team and he went straight to varsity. He's an awesome student, awesome player. And then Jiho has actually been with us uh, since we started and has had the opportunity to win both uh, state championships as a freshman and, and a sophomore last year. So we're really proud of him and happy we're gonna get to keep him for hopefully another two years and just super proud of these guys. And yeah, y'all go ahead and say something for me. <laughs> I guess I'll go. Uh, thank you having me uh it's been a great first year uh it's given me something to do in this like hard times uh, at home obviously having like people my teammates my friends i guess to, to practice esports with to play around and stuff um and this goes to our district you know recognizing uh, at an all-state level and um as a, i'm in a, a bunch of different clubs such as band and uh, uh what's it called chem club and and east uh, earth club and stuff like that uh having a state champion is just different um it's a lot a, a lot bigger of a recognition which i'm really proud to to present to everyone here thank you jonathan hi uh i guess i'll speak <laughs> uh it's been really fun being part of the program uh everyone involved is great and i'm getting a lot of support from everyone around me and i'm definitely going to stay for another two years and i hope I can stay a state champion, and I like uh, I. It's all thanks to my great teammates, including Johnny and the seniors, and yeah, everyone else. Thank you, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight, and thank you for your dedication and the work that you've been doing to bring another state championship to Cabo Heritage. Congratulations. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. And that concludes tonight's recognitions. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. That was great. Um, we'll move on to open forum, but um, I don't believe anyone signed up for the, for the open forum on the um, budget hearing. Uh, so we'll move on to the uh, public hearing to uh, discuss the 2020-2021 budget. Yes, as, as usual, we do have the, uh, uh, we have to have a hearing uh, previously to uh, uh, considering the budget. And so we'll ask our CFO, uh, Dan Mooney, to take us through uh, the budget hearing. Hey, Kyle, can I, sh can you give me access to share? Okay, you're good. All right. Good. All right. So tonight we are holding the hearing to discuss the 2021 uh, budget um, that will be adopted later on in the evening. Just want to start off talking about uh, the legal requirements of the budget. The board is legally required to adopt the budget for the general fund, child nutrition fund, debt service fund, at the function level, and the function level is defined by the state. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Here are some of the highlights for the general fund budget. Uh, this is based on uh, the House Bill 3 funding laws that were enacted uh, during the 86th legislative session. The budget was developed with a projected enrollment of 14,306. That includes traditional enrollment of 13,311, 
and iUniversity prep enrollment of 1,175. The budget is based on an M&O tax rate of 95.64 cents. And I do want to point out that the final tax rate will be calculated by TEA in August and approved by the board in August. Uh, this will be based on the July 25th certified uh, property values. The debt service budget is built on the tax rate of 35.67 cents, which is no change from the prior year. This budget does include a compensation adjustment for all employees uh, with a starting teacher salary of 54,000 and all employees are receiving at least a 1% of midpoint adjustment. It does include a recapture payment to the state of 50.9 million. This calculates to about 31.5 cents of every tax dollar collected uh, will be paid to the state. And this is just based on our estimated um, values and the budgeted tax rate. So this slide gives us the uh, general fund budget at the object level. And I like this slide because it shows uh, broke, broken out by the various types of expenditures. And you can see line one is our payroll budget at 120.8 million and is 87.63% of our total operating budget. So line six, um, is what I like to call our total operating budget, because this is the budget that we operate um, on a daily basis, um, the district. Then line seven is our recapture payment, and line eight is our payment to the tax increment fund, which leaves us a total budget of, on line nine of 196.6 million. Okay. It's not wanting to go. If you hit escape and take it out of presentation mode, will it? That is so strange because it's it's not doing anything. Don't we love technology? Yes. Oh, yes, we do. Okay. I'm going to, I guess I'll stop sharing it. Yeah. Try to get back in it. Okay. Yeah. So there I am on the object. Okay. Well, can y'all see it? Not yet. There it is, it's coming up. Okay, I may just leave it in this mode just so that it won't. Can you guys see it, still see it? Well, okay. Yes. I have no idea what's going on here. Okay, so the next slide is just a picture of what I just talked about um, of the budget in the object level. You can see on the left-hand side, that's our total operating budget. So it excludes recapture and TIF. The red piece of the pie is the largest piece, and that is payroll. So on the right-hand side, I have the same comparison, but it is the total budget, which includes recapture and TIF. And you can see that the payroll, um, the red uh, piece of the pie is the payroll, and it, it goes down some. But then the second biggest piece of that pie is the maroon color, um, which is the recapture payment. Now this slide shows you the total operating budget at the function level. And as I mentioned, uh, this, these functions are uh, defined by the state. So that's how we categorize our uh, expenditures. Um, this shows the uh, proposed budget uh, versus the final amended budget that will be approved later this evening. Um, on line one, that is our total instruction budget uh, is 87. 7 million. That is 63.63% of the total operating budget. And then this is the total budget, which 
includes recapture and TIF. I know that says excludes, but it is it does include it. And um, if you look at line one, um, the, the expenditure stays the same, but the percentage um, decreases to 44.64% because of the recapture payment being the second largest um, piece of our budget um, on line nine, the recapture is 25.89% of the total budget. And this is just the uh, pie chart that kind of shows you at the function level, the operating budget excludes recapture and TIF. And so instruction is the large red piece of the pie. And then when you look at the uh, total budget, the um, red piece of the pie is instruction. Um, that is the largest piece, but then the recapture is um, the second largest piece of that budget. So just focus on a little bit um, on the revenues that are included in the general fund. Um, line two is our uh, taxes, which is part of local revenue. Uh, that is 81.24% of our total revenues. And then line five just gives you our total local revenues, which is about 171.1 million and include is about 89.9% of our revenue budget. So um, our budget is supported um, greatly with our uh, tax collections. And then line six is the state revenue of 17.1 million. That's about 8.99% of our uh, revenues. And then you can see there line nine, our total revenues are 109.4 million. This is just the picture to kind of show you that local and other resources is the largest piece of our revenue budget. This slide just gives you a summary of the general fund budget, a very simple revenues expenditures um, compared to the final amended budget. We are looking at a net operating result um, for the 2021 proposed budget of 6.3 million use of fund balance. This is just the summary of the child nutrition budget. Um, we have budgeted revenues and expenditures to be the same, about 6.1 million. The next budget we're going to talk about is the debt service fund. This is the budget that we use to pay for our uh, voter approved bonds. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the debt service tax rate will be 35.67 cents. That is no change. So that will be the same as the 2019 tax rate. Um, this will be used to support the bond program that was approved by voters in May of 2016 and the amount of 248.9 75 million. This budget does include a payment of 1.5 million that we receive from the City of Grapevine Gaylord TIF. Uh, we receive a payment um, annually to help um, pay for uh, debt service. And then this budget includes a bond prepayment of 12.78 million. We will be prepaying some of the series 2011 bonds. And when we do that, um, it is estimated that our uh, savings and future interest costs will be 7.9 million. You're going to see on this budget, there is a budget surplus of 6.35 million. And uh, this is going to be used to cover uh, an August 2021 bond payment. So here are just the, is the breakdown of the debt service budget. Line one is the tax collections and line two is other revenues. So that's where we include that 1.5 million TIF payment that we receive from the city of Grapevine. Line four is our total principal payments. Line five is the principal prepayment uh, that I talked about. So that's the 12.78 million. Line six is the interest payment and line seven is the miscellaneous fees that we pay um, for our bond transactions. So total expenditures on line eight is 56.4 million. So when compared to the total revenues of 62.8 million, um, that leaves us on line nine, a net operating result of 6.35 million.
And last, I just want to say this has been a really long process. We, I think we had our first um, budget workshop in December. And there is just a lot of groups that help contribute to this budget. And so I just want to say thank you guys, um, the board, for uh, listening and um, making just making hard decisions on the budget. And um, I know all of our campus administration, our central administration, we just all work together to um, put this budget together and, and looked at all of the um, resources that we had and how we could um, use those resources to better serve our students. So that's all I have, unless you have any questions. Thank you, Diane. This is a uh, public hearing and we will, this will come back to us to um, vote and discuss at that time. I don't believe anyone had signed up, Doug, to, to comment during this hearing. That, that's correct, nobody signed up. Okay. So at this time, we will um, hold our questions until it actually comes up um, for discussion. So at this time, the public hearing is closed and we will move on to the reports of the superintendent. We'll move on to item A, act on the recommendation for executive director of learning. Dr. Ryan? Yes, uh, our current uh, executive director of learning is Dr. Suzanne Newell. Uh, Suzanne has done a tremendous job and made a, a very, uh, Big impact uh, on everyone in GCISD as she has led the curriculum and instruction team for the last several years. And uh, she has instituted so, uh, such things as uh, the Learning Institute, which I know all of our trustees are familiar with as far as how she has, she and her team have uh, revamped the prof professional development opportunities in GCISD. She also was a, a big proponent and uh, one of the first leaders of Student Voice. In GCISD, she's a big help with our community-based accountability. Uh, she has been a great part of our team, and uh, she is leaving us to go to Austin ISD, and we uh, certainly want to wish her well, but we want to at first say thank you to Suzanne uh, for her uh, extremely good work uh, while uh, during her time here in GCISD, and we will miss her, and we wish her the very best as she moves to Austin ISD. Now, of course, that, that leaves a vacancy, and the in the executive director for learning position uh, and we're very fortunate tonight to be able to provide a recommendation to the board this evening of someone who is returning to GCISD. Uh, Lainey Norman uh, has taught for 10 years in GCISD uh, as a at, well she's been an employee for 10 years as a uh, English teacher, volleyball coach, an instructional coach, uh, a, a learning liaison and an assistant principal at Colville Middle School before leaving GCISD and going to get some uh, uh, experience uh, in the curriculum instruction world. Uh, she's about to finish up her doctorate in uh, in September, so uh, she's really been very busy <clears throat> during her time away from GCISD. And uh, so uh, we're excited to make this recommendation. The recommendation is for the board trustees to approve the recommendation of Laney Norman for the executive director of learning. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. I have a recommendation. Do I have a motion? Jesse? I'd like to make the motion. Oh, Louie, go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we accept Dr. Ryan's nomination of Lane Norman for uh, the new position. In the second. Jesse, second? Yeah, I, I second that. Very much. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, call for a vote. All those in favor? Uh, motion. motion carries seven zero. And we do have uh, Mrs. Norman uh, who's joined us. Yes, thank you, and and congratulations, Ms. Norman, and and welcome back to GCISD. We're glad you you found the the way back to us. <laughs> thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Dr. Ryan, for that. Um, good evening, board. I wish I was there to shake all of your hands. Um, so excited to meet you guys. Um, but I just want to tell you that I'm excited to return home and serve GCISD in this capacity. Um, I look forward to officially meeting you and working with you. So thank you for that. We will be Lainey, seeing much just, more of you. Thank you. Uh, Lane, I just want to congratulate you oh. very much. It was the first time I met you when uh, 
Dr. Gropel and uh, Conrad. Well, when Conrad was a principal at Colorado Heritage High School, he spoke highly about you and said we would see you probably in the administration someday. And then you left us and was like, what happened? Well, we knew you had to go grow and and uh, expand your knowledge. So very excited to have you back because we've heard nothing but great things about you and looking forward to what you can do uh, in this role for us. So welcome back to the family. Thank you, Louie, for your kind words. And no other comments, we will be seeing no, I guess Jesse has one. Yes, Jesse. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, first of all, congratulations, but I also want to just let Dr. Newell just uh, again, thank her uh, for an amazing job that she did while she was here. And then also want to extend our best wishes to her new home in Austin and uh, and wish her much luck. So best wishes. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Norman. Thank you. We're going to move on to item, item B, um, act. Act on waiver delaying of parent notice requirements for grades four and seven for students at risk of failing the star in the upcoming student success initiative school year. Dr. Ryan. Yes, these next couple of items uh, are a continuation of waivers uh, that uh, the board uh, can consider uh, that are related to uh, the COVID-19 uh, situation across the state of Texas. Uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Schnauts take it from here. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ryan. As you know, we, we brought, as Dr. Ryan mentioned, we brought several uh, COVID related waivers uh, brought down by TEA. Shannon Tovar has been uh, very instrumental in helping us get approved for these waivers. And so I'm going to kick it to Shannon. Are you with us, Shannon? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Got my Grapevine High School cap on today. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. So we have the, um, both of those uh, waivers that were coming forward. And um, is this the, sorry, I was, when I was punching in, I forgot to tell which that, one we were talking about first. That's okay. Shannon, okay. this is the parent notification. Okay. This is the grades four and seven. Essentially, um, at the end of each, uh, when the students are at the end of the school year for grades four and seven, we use a variety of data at the campus level to kind of get a sense of which students we feel teachers and principals feel like will not be successful um, on the star in the fifth and eighth grade. So a year later. And so it's kind of an early notification warning. This waiver doesn't waive us from the requirement to actually interact with and inform parents, but it does recognize that from about spring break until the end of the year, the students really weren't with us in the same sort of way. And so even though we do have data points up to the mid part of the year that would be consistent with across all students um, that they use to decide which students should be invited to dream camp, which is pre K through five or also middle schools were to um, invite rising eighth graders to some summer work to help get them ready. Um, we do have new things in place, but we didn't do the formal notification process and then including star data from the end of the year because we didn't have star. So in uh, the beginning of the school year, what will happen is we still, uh, we still have to do some early warning with fifth and eighth grade parents. And so we'll use a variety of our district, um, and possibly some of the state um, developed resources to identify those students early on. Uh, and then that way we can get that notification to parents at the beginning of the year. The advantage to this in a way is that we're gonna have some students that around March we thought we're on track and we're okay. And so if we do, if we use that data only, uh, then we might miss a few who over the course of the closure and over the summer may have fallen behind or suffered uh, maybe some, a little bit of some uh, moving backwards a little bit. And so that'll help us recapture another group, even though this summer we're still serving students that we already knew um, were needing some additional support. Thank you, Shannon. Sure. Uh, the recommendation is for the board trustees to approve the district to submit a parent notification for students at risk of failure waiver for the 2019-20 school year. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? Mindy? I move that we accept Dr. Ryan's recommendation. Thank you, Mindy. In a second. Becky? Yeah, I'll second it. 
Thank you, Becky. Um, any questions or discussion? Uh, Jesse? Yeah, I just, uh, point of clarification. Uh, Shannon, this is just a formality, correct? I mean, the TEA has authorized the districts being able to submit the waiver. So the fact that we're doing that is just complying with that, um, correct? I mean, so it's not a question of them looking at it, evaluating it, and then deciding not to accept no, it, correct? Absolutely is realizing that we're probably our ability to contact all families is looking a little bit different and that you know in the state of um, closure and uh, disaster that we're in um, this way uh, when we do notify in August September possibly things will look a little bit different and we'll make sure that um, you know families I think will be more prepared to hear it too so this is really TEA suggestion we're just following through okay thank you Mm -hmm. Jorge? So we usually give this notification to parents before the end of the school year, correct? And then we usually have the star scores as part of the notification. Towards the different time points in time, we also have star scores that would reaffirm what we already kind of suspect. It's more of an affirming kind of thing, yes. But don't we know already the names of these students that are struggling that probably will not have passed the star? And if so, why don't we tell them, tell the parents now? I mean, because you still have the summer to be able to kind of help them out before they start a new school year. Why? I do understand that COVID-19 brings some challenges, but if we know that some of these kids were not gonna pass the star. I mean, we had data up to spring break. Why wouldn't you, we tell the parents, you know, right now that these kids, your kid was struggling. He probably was, wasn't was gonna pass star. And maybe there's something that we can do this summer. I mean, this summer so that when the fall comes, they're they're ready to, to come to the school. Absolutely. And so five students were identified and we went via our dream camp in the summer serves K through five. And they, um, that's based on some of those middle, um, some of those middle of year and different uh, reading and math indicators. And so there are students, those probably are students who are in danger of failing the star in the next school year, if, it's gonna, if they're gonna be in a star assessed area. So really the students that we suspect who are probably not going to be successful on that fifth and eighth have pro are already being invited to our summer dream camp or to the middle school camp already. It's really just PEA likes a form. There's a formal process. And so that's the part that we are asking to be able to do in August. The students are being served and supported. Yes. If if the student is offered this dream camp, do they have to go? Is it mandatory or it's actually optional? You know, that's something I'm going to need to follow up more with um, the principles of the dream camp for the summer. I think with, um, you know, we did make a modification where the students used to have to come in person. It is virtual at this point, but it, I, don't, I do not believe, but we can follow up with you that this attendance is not a barrier to going to the next school year if they don't, but we can make sure we can get that answer for you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Seeing none, then we'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries, there we go. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, Ms. Tover. You're welcome. Move on, move on to item C. Um, act on commissioners adopted kindergarten and seventh grade reading in instrument requirement waiver for the 2020-2021 school year. Dr. Ryan? Yes, this is a, uh, a similar type of waiver, and uh, we'll ask uh, Dr. Schnauts and Ms. Tovar to, to again take us through this uh, this item as well. All right, Shannon. All right. You're up. Uh, essentially, uh, the, um, Section 28 of the TEC requires the commissioner to identify, this is new, to identify um, a kindergarten screener that we're all two kindergarten screeners for us to choose from for all tex Texas school districts. They chose Texkia and they chose M class. And they let us know about this in um, May that those were some of our going to be some of our options as we're looking. And so we started working on, well, what would that look like? 
In the meantime, obviously, the school districts were all closed for the closure. Then TEA followed up a little bit later and said, listen, um, you're not you're not face to face with your staffs. What we need probably need to do is uh, let you all have a waiver for a year in terms of implementation. So you have a better chance to um, look some more at the two options and choose, even though we already had assessment and uh, special education curriculum instruction, looking at the two options as well as um, our interventions, a coordinator for interventions. Um, we were already kind of looking, we were relieved to see that waiver. I think on the heels of the COVID closure and all the things teachers are gonna be asked to do that are new this year, as well as our investment in Ames Web, the last thing we really wanted to do was start the school year with kindergarten teachers telling them, hey, by the way, we want you to learn a new screener and we appreciate TEA realizing that uh, this waiver would be a good thing for everyone's, uh, I think uh, maybe we can chalk this a little bit up to social and emotional wellness. Same thing for seventh grade. Seventh grade, it was going to be a beginning of year screener, and you had to choose between I Station, uh, Woodcock Johnson, um, a middle school. Uh, there's four of them that you could choose from. It's the same sort of situation where, again, TEA said, uh, you know, here's this waiver opportunity. It's just for this one year coming on the um, through all the things that we're having to do that are going to be new and different this fall. It's just not the best time to ask people to switch um, to a new screening instrument at the beginning of the year. It is for the one year only, but that'll be great because it'll give us a better chance to kind of look in our new setting, whether it's virtual or in person or how that's going to look uh, for our teachers to have a chance to get a better feel for what would work best in our in our settings. Thank you, Shannon. The recommendations for the board trustees to approve the district to submit a waiver to TEA in, in order to continue with our current reading assessment instrument for kindergarten and grade seven students for the 2020-21 school year in lieu of the commissioner adopted reading instruments. Jesse, I think Lisa dropped off, so you may have to take over until she's back. Okay. Um, all right, the recommendation's been made by the superintendent. Uh, and you're going to have to help me here because I don't think I can see everyone. But uh, are um, are there any since the motions uh, recommendations been made? Do I have a motion? I'm, I move we accept the superintendent's recommendation. Okay, the recommendation has been made by Doug. Is there a second? A second. Uh, Mindy has second. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, I will before I accept the vote. I will state that I myself will uh, abstain from voting on this uh, specific motion. So I just wanted the records to reflect that. So all those in favor, um, I might end up having to ask for roll since I can't see everyone. Uh, uh, but Becky? Aye. Uh, Jorge? Is Jorge? Aye. I can't, okay, thank you. I can't see you guys. Louis? Uh Thank you. Mindy? Aye. Uh, and Doug? Aye. And, and just so you know, Lisa's back. Okay. Lisa? Aye. And so that is two, four, <laughs> six ayes uh, and zero noes and one abstention. Jesse. Uh, so, uh, Lisa, if you'd Thank care you. to. Thank make, you, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you for Absolutely. stepping in there. Um, we're having some quite a few um, technical problems tonight. I will say um, I am not on a GCISD computer, and GCISD did not repair my computer, or I probably wouldn't be having these problems. So you all know where I'm going tomorrow, probably Best Buy. Uh, we'll move on to item D, act on um, iUniversity prep course approval. Dr. Ryan? Yes, as the board knows, we've been working on um course approvals for uh, university prep, and I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Rogers to take us through uh, this item. Yes, so uh, thank you, Dr. Ryan. As is required uh, all online schools so as I university prep is a full time option. Okay. I think we're having a little hard time here in UK. Is, can anybody else hear? Okay. Okay, yeah. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, that's much better. Okay, so uh, at iUniversity Prep is a full-time online school through uh, 
GCRC, we must have uh, approved courses. So all of our courses must be 100% TESOLI, 100% IDA compliant, and 508 compliant. So let's spend time to expedite the process of writing our own courses. So you see on the list in uh, of courses, there's extra speech. Can you hear me? You're breaking up or getting lighter. Okay. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay. So uh, you'll see on your course list that there are courses that are courses or ones that are university prep writers have written over this school year. So all of our sixth grade courses and seventh grade courses listed are up for approval and they have that and are meeting all of those requirements. Our courses that are on this list and they are ones that we still purchase, but because of the standards update, we need to make those changes in those courses. And therefore, go through the approval process uh, for those also. So that is the course. All of those have, um, will go for a three year approval process. Okay, thank you, Kay, very much. And thank you for uh, your work throughout the year to try to get these courses written uh, so that we can consider their approval this evening. The recommendation is for the Board of Trustees to approve the courses listed in the attachment as the GCISD approved online courses. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. I have a, a recommendation. Do I have a motion? Jesse? Yes, I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation, please. Thank you, Jesse. In a second? Like it. Doug, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Uh, Jorge. I saw some high school courses there. Like, is that just a regular course, or do we also do the did the AP version? So we do the AP versions. Those are not would not have to be reapproved, but for the others, those would need to go through the approval process. So those again are ones that we have purchased, not the ones we have written. Did you hear? Could you hear her, Jorge? Barely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not feeling bad at this point, being that you're in charge of our online and you're having trouble. <laughs> it, is, it is the world sometimes. It but... is. It is. We just keep going. Any other questions for Dr. Rogers? Seeing none, we'll go ahead for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Move on to item E Act on the contract with Panorama Education to provide social emotional assessments and aligned resources. Dr. Ryan? Yes, this is a portion uh, to support LEED 2.0 uh, with our students and uh, families and counseling staff. And I'll ask Dr. Uh, Schnauz to take us uh, the rest of the way on this. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ryan. So we're excited to bring this item before you trustees. Um, you know, going back to the workshop and going back to uh, the LEAD 2.0 highlight, uh, you heard social emotional wellness uh, referenced numerous times. And as we progress through our LEAD 2.0 work, um, we, we always want to find ways to support uh, our leaders, to support our campuses, to support our teachers and students. Uh, in, in their educational experiences and and in goal two, we really want to provide uh, all of our all of those groups, our, our students, our teachers with the resources necessary to, to build up and to to support goal two. Uh, this partnership with Panorama allows us to uh, provide uh, survey tools, allows us to provide uh, action planning resources for our teachers. Uh, to to meet and, and really hone in on the needs of our students, the social emotional needs of our students, but also to our teachers. Um, the great thing about Panorama guys is it also they they have partnered and aligned with Character Strong, which is our character ed program that that we've adopted. And so there's seamless alignment there. Our counselors are going to be able to to really tap into to both of those uh, sides of resources twofold. Um, so this is much needed as far as having a, a, a plethora of resources on the social emotional wellness side for our people. Uh, it will give us valuable information 
on the social emotional well being of our students and then we can kind of come up with a plan on really how to um, meet those needs and support not only our students, but also our teachers. The last positive that I'll mention is we're able to fund this through our Title IV funds. Uh, the Title IV has a requirement that uh, you must uh, spend monies that align with the safe and healthy students uh, initiative within Title IV. And, and so this meets that criteria uh, that we're, we're uh, you know, spending Title IV monies that align with the safe and healthy uh, schools portion. So we're we're not only uh, focused on uh, you know uh, accomplishing goal two, but we're also uh, meeting the requirements there in Title IV. So uh, it's kind of it's a win-win here, and I think uh, our, our our campuses are really excited about uh, taking this on as we start uh, the 2021 year, um, and and we're excited about uh, seeing the gains and the benefits from this partnership. So that's all I have, Dr. Ryan. Thank you, Dr. Schnatz. Recommendations for the board trustees to approve the contract with Panorama Education Incorporated for social emotional surveys and aligned resources. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a, a motion? Doug. I, I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation. Thank you, Doug. And a second. I second. Mindy, thank you, Mindy. Um, any questions? Jesse. Uh, yes, Brad. Uh, just a couple of questions. When you when you talk about a, a, the survey, is this a survey that's going to be well? Can you talk a little more about that? In other words, is this a just a one time instrument that is going to be sent out at the beginning, or is this going to be an ongoing? Mm -hmm. They're going to do three of them: a mid year and a final year uh, type of uh, assessment survey. And it says, if I'm reading this correct, it says students and staff. So does that mean that? Not only will the students participate on the survey, but so will teachers, administrators. I, mean, I just want to make sure I understand when we talk about staff, who all we're talking about. And like I said, the first part of that question was, is this just a one time uh, instrument that gets offered at the beginning? And then I have another follow up question, but if you could help me there first. Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer the first part about as far as the frequency of the, the surveys. And so right now we have uh, included uh this the social emotional survey piece in our assessment calendar and so the goal is for us to to give a big beginning of year a mid-year and end of year survey uh right now um and as far as who will be taking that survey uh certainly our students will but we also want to survey our, our, our teaching our teachers and our teaching staff uh we haven't really talked about the the administrators at this time the campus leaders but that's something that we can consider I will say this too, that the, the great thing about Panorama is they allow us to customize the surveys uh, to, to kind of what we see fit, what's you know the best need, the, the areas that we want to focus on. And so there's flexibility there as far as with our unique needs here in GCISD. Uh, along with, there could be specific campus needs that, that maybe need tweaking, you know? Um, and so that customization along with the frequency piece, I think we're going to get some valuable data uh, from from just this this survey tool. I also want to go back to the the resources that they're going to provide. So let's say we get the data back, or when we get the data back from the surveys, and it says you know X Y and Z. Well, their their action planning resources for teachers give them the resources and the tool to now go to go address X Y and Z for for Brad or A B and C for for Jesse, and so they're able to really customize that support by student our teachers are okay well and and i'm glad you stated that because that was going to be my second question in terms of exactly if you could describe those um are we going to be working when it says collaborative effort are we talking in terms then of working with our counselors at each of the campuses and getting them involved as well too besides just the the the, the teachers a absolutely so we're going to be working with our, our counseling team with our student advocates our campus leaders uh, we're we're going to try to build the capacity across all campuses, and so it's something that, as you know, unfortunately, we do have uh, finite resources, and so there's only a few counselors, there's only a few APs, but we have to empower all to understand this, and also, too, we want our, our parent community to understand this, too, and the significance of it so that they can help at home, those at-home resources, which are critical as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Becky. 
Yeah, uh, Brad, that's actually a great segue into the questions I had. Can you speak a little bit to um, uh, the privacy surrounding these surveys? Like what, what can I expect as a parent as far as um, preserving privacy? And what, like, are these going to be like broad topics like bullying at a campus? Or how how individual specific are these going to be? And I know that's a fine line, right? I mean, teachers have yeah. the most contact with students during a day than you know some days even even their parents and, and families at home, and so they often see things that you know might not be evident at home, and that's a good opportunity to intervene. At the same time, you know they're in a classroom with. 11 or 20 or whatever we're going to have this year. So can you speak to some of the privacy um, issues that arise out of something like this? Yeah, so uh, without, I can't go into too much detail on that because I'm not, I'm not too familiar with all the privacies. I'll just kind of give you an idea of what some of the, the areas or, or strategies that, uh, that we're going to focus on it with, within these surveys. And so you have emotional regulation, you have grit, growth mindset, school and classroom climate, teacher student relationships, engagement, self efficacy, self management, sense of belonging, sense of safety, social awareness, teacher growth mindset. And so the surveys and the samples that I've seen from Panorama just are, are really uh, kind of broad and, and, and allow for allow for some theming and patterns to occur so that I know that that maybe this is an area that that you know Becky could be uh, challenged in or, or, or needing some support in but I don't think it's anything going into great detail on the the privacy or confidentiality that's going to compromise any any of those um, uh, I guess sensitive that sensitive information and put that out there does that make sense yeah, in fact, as you're rattling off those things, it sounds a little bit higher level, executive yeah. skills focused, classroom success, um, thing, things of that nature. Yes, it, and, and that's that is the goal that it stays more kind of like thirty thousand foot level. Now, the stuff that you know, some of the more sensitive topics and issues, we still have the counseling and the student advocates support there for, as well as our teachers are trained to, to kind of sense some of that out and know the the direct. Uh, the, the correct and the direct avenues to st send students and parents to, but that's not really the purpose of this, this survey platform. Uh, it's more or less to stay kind of at the high level. Um, and then, you know, we're able to take this information, as I mentioned earlier, and use those resources, those teacher resources to kind of help build, you know, the grit skills or the, the emotional regulation or social awareness in, in, in children. So. When when the kids um, take these surveys, will parents get notification that this is happening? And I'm hopeful that Panorama will even possibly be providing resources that families can utilize at home. Yes, yes. So we will we will send that notification. You know, just to uh, let our families know that these surveys will be uh, administered. Um, as far as the the parent resources, I'm not. Um, I'm not too familiar with those, uh, but but I know that uh, that's something that you know we could get you guys more information on in a board update. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate yeah, it. You're welcome. Good questions, Becky. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor? Motion carries seven zero. Thank you, Dr. Schnauz. Move on to item um, F, act on the 2019-2020 final amended budget. Dr. Ryan. This is next segment of items uh, are uh, carried by uh, Dan Mooney, our CFO. And the first one is uh, the final amended budget for this current school year. Dan. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Each year, the district must amend the budget to ensure at the end of the year to ensure that the actual expenditures don't exceed the budget at the function level. And so that's what we are doing here tonight. Um, you uh, will notice there are several adjustments um, made between functions to adjust our payroll budget. This is something that is typically, we typically just wait until the end of the year based on what my payroll projections, how they come out to make those adjustments. 
Um, we have also adjusted the revenues to match what our state funding is and what our other projected revenues are. So you see that we amended the budget. We actually added 2.1 million um, to the amended budget. And that is because based on when we, when we adopted the budget in June, uh, if you recall, House Bill 3 had just been passed and there were a lot of pieces in that funding that we did not have enough information to even budget for. And once those all got finalized during the fiscal year, um, we ended up having our, our state funding was three, about 3 million more than what we had budgeted. So I'm adjusting for that adjustment, but then also um, we talked a little bit about the CARES Act funding, the way the school district is going to receive the CARES Act funding it, from the state is it's going to replace a portion of what we would have received from the state in state funding. So our foundation school um, allotment. And that amount is $1,096,109. The way they are going to um, adjust our state funding is in the 1920 school year. So what I have, um, because we had that excess revenue um, already built into the budget, and we've already talked about all the various needs that we're going to have in the 2021 budget year, we're going to look at recording a portion of that CARES Act uh, allotment in next fiscal year. But what that means for the 1920 fiscal year is that we are not going to record as much revenue as we would have. So when you net those two amounts, you net the 3 million, but you take away the, the reduction in state funding for the CARES Act, that's the $2 million uh, adjustment to revenue. I typically do not adjust down on the expenditure side of the budget uh, for the very reason that we want to make sure that we have budget appropriated in the correct at the function level, because if we overspend at the function level, um, that's that's something that they put in our audit report. And um, so typically on my final amended budget, I try to just make sure I look, I project out based at the function level and then amend the budget to reflect what those projections will be. On the uh, child nutrition budget, um, we did make some amendments for the reduction in food sales due to the COVID closure. Uh, but then we were also able to reduce some of the expenditures because we didn't have um, the food cost uh, also due to the closure. So you will see those amounts reflected on the uh, child nutrition budget where we reduced um, the revenue about 800,000, but we were also able to reduce the expenditures 400,000. So really um, the estimated uh, budget use of fund balance will be uh, closer to 476,000. On the debt service fund, we just amended the local tax revenue to reflect the final projections uh, for collections. And then I also amended the principal and interest expenditures to reflect the actual payments that we made during the fiscal year. So we, when we went out and sold bonds in September of 2019, that sometimes makes small changes in what your next payment's going to be. And since we had adopted the budget prior to selling those bonds, um, we just need to adopt, uh, amend the budget to reflect the actual payments. Okay, Question? thank you, Diane. The recommendations for the Board of Trustees to approve the 2019-20 final amended budgets for the General Fund, the Child Nutrition Fund, and Debt Service Fund is presented in the final budget amendment reports. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? Jesse? Yes, I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation, please. Thank you, Jesse. Do I have a second? I'll second. Louie, thank you. Any discussion or any questions? 
Jeffrey? Yeah, I just have a, a question for Dan. As far as the, the CARES uh, stimulus dollars, uh, have we received that already, or what's what's the timetable for us to receive that from the state? We have not received the funds. We've received the allotment, what the allotment's going to be, and the application just opened on Friday. So we'll be working on getting that application out. Um, and I think it's due by the end of July, so we should be getting our notice of grant awards the first part of August. Okay, so by us submitting that paperwork, and this is, this is, bear with me here. So we've gotten, we have received notice as far as our allocation, correct? Yes. Now we have to submit the necessary paperwork to apply for that, correct? Yes. Now, is that, again, going back to a previous uh, action item, is that just a formality, Dan, and we're still, and then we're getting our full allocation or based on the review of our application, those dollars could be reduced or, you know, or raised, or is that what the allocation is, is it? That's what the allocation is. And we, we have, they're going to reduce our state funding, whether we apply for that or not, because that's some some districts have been asking, do we even have to apply for this? But right. um, they're going to reduce our state funding anyway, so we definitely have to apply for it. Um, I don't anticipate the amounts changing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Any other questions? Jorge, did you have a, did you have a question? No? No. No other, no, thank you, Diane, very much. Welcome. Um, seeing no questions, um, call for a vote. All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Move on to item G act on the adoption of the 2020 2020 2021 accelerated instruction budget. Dr. Ryan? Yes, these next three items, uh, as the as board members will recall, uh, have to be considered in this order uh, when uh, when we are considering the uh, adoption of a new budget. So the first one is the uh, acting on the adoption of the accelerated instructional budget and the recommendations for the board trustees to adopt the 2020-2021 accelerated instruction budget in the amount of $90,100. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? I move we accept Dr. Ryan's recommendation. Thank you, Doug. In a second? A second. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. <clears throat> move on to item H Act on the 2020 2021 compensation plan for all district employees. Uh, yes, uh, again, uh, Prior to adopting the, the whole budget, that the uh, board uh, should consider the compensation plan for all district employees. And um, I'll um, read the recommendation. Recommendations for the board trustees to approve the 2020 2021 compensation plan and pay increases as presented. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for this recommendation? Jesse? Yes, I make the, I mean, I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation. Thank you. And a second, Doug, any questions or comments on this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries 7-0. Yeah. Uh, move on to item I, act on the adoption of the 2020-2021 budget, Dr. Ryan. Yes, as uh, Diane mentioned a few uh, uh, items ago, the board has been working and our uh, finance office and uh, really all of our teams across the school district have been working since December uh, to bring to you the budget uh, for 2020 and 2021 next, next school year. It's very difficult to build this budget with so many unanswered questions. Uh, however, uh, Diane and her team have just done a tremendous job of uh, it's very difficult. School finance is very difficult in the first place, but uh, when you add all of the uh, COVID information and some of the items that uh, we were just discussing just a few moments ago, it's just really been complex. And so um, uh, I would just like to say thank you to Diane and her team, uh, who just did a tremendous job of getting it to this point. Um, and so uh, this budget 
uh, is uh, certainly for consideration for uh, next school year. The recommendation is for the board of trustees to adopt the 2020-2021 general operating budget as presented in the amount of $196,647,281. The 2020-21 debt service budget as presented in the amount of $56,404,588. And the 2020-2021 child nutrition budget as presented in the amount of $6,107,319. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for this recommendation? Louis. I make a motion to accept Dr. Ryan's recommendation for the 2021 budget. Thank you, Louis. Do I have a second? Uh, Jorge. I'll second. Thank you, Jorge. Do we have any um, questions for Becky? Yeah, so especially as we've just been kind of going through this evening, I have um, in all the COVID planning. So two questions, and I wish I thought of these earlier, so I'm sorry, Dan, but on the child nutrition budget. Um, so uh, obviously, if we're not in school, we're, if we're not in the building, then we're not selling things in the cafeteria. So how how does because i was trying to look back and get a feel for how the child nutrition budget was impacted um particularly revenue wise with the partial shutdown how how much of the child nutrition budget making that budget i'm trying to figure out what i'm trying to ask here is contingent upon having those cafeterias open i know we get federal money for the for the child nutrition program but more interested in the impact that you know, if my kid is not buying three bags of chips every day, how does that how does that impact our bottom line and and being able to make that budget next year? That does that would that will make an impact on the budget. And at this point, we've built a budget uh, just assuming that um, we're going back to school and it's going to going to to look like it has in the past. Um, if we have to make adjustments to the budget. You know, we will certainly do that to to adjust revenue down. However, um, for the feeding program, we we have been receiving the federal funds that have done a great job of offsetting um, those costs. Um, we're still trying to close out the fiscal year, so I'll have a better idea for you in maybe a month or two, because um, I think that's a great question. And then at this that at that point, we may. Um, we make some decisions to amend the budget, but for this budget to adopt tonight, we just did it as if things are going to be normal. Okay, yeah, because I know that's asking probably a little much. So, hey, Diane, what do you think Trad Nutrition is going to look like, you know, for a 10 month period next year? I know that's got to be really, really difficult. Okay. Um, my other question um, involves the TIF. Um, it looks like uh, it had an increased payment of over half a million dollars. Um, that was a pretty big jump. Can you explain why that jumped so much? So what I, I based that um, on the estimated tax rate and this year's and this year's values that increased, I mean, and I increased them 4%. I increased the values 4%. So. I believe it, the payment will go up um, without really knowing what our M and O tax rate is. It's hard to kind of calculate that TIF payment right now. So once we know what the tax rate is, we can uh, make that amendment. But really, in our budget, the TIF is offset with the revenue, so it, it's really a wash in the um, in the budget. So yes, the the payment went up five hundred thousand, but up at the top, the, the revenues also are at 500000 So there's not really a way to make that payment go down, unless, but it is contingent upon the tax rate. So when the tax rate goes down, the TIF payment goes down. Yes, which is what happened this year. Right, right. Okay. All right. It's based on yeah. 27 cents. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh -huh. yeah. Jesse? Uh, Diane, going back to the answer, and I'm pretty sure this is going to be the same answer to my question, but the, the first question that Becky asked or trustee Becky asked in, 
in terms of the child nutrition. I was looking at the other end, the MNO side. If indeed we have to make adjustments to our classrooms, say all of a sudden to accommodate whatever the rule might be for in person, and we have to set up partitions at the desk and spread out and double up on teachers, you know, things like that, then the answer to that would be that we would end up having to amend the budget at that point, correct? I mean, is that is that pretty much a, the answer? That is correct when we know the impact because, right. you know, we have the million dollars in CARES Act, but if there's anything beyond that, um, it would definitely be something that we would go back and amend our budget just because right now there's there's so many unknowns. And so, yes. Yeah, so I, so I guess what I'm just getting at is that the the response or the the solution would be that we would go back and amend the budget to to reflect Absolutely. whatever expenses we incur. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote for the 2020-2021 budget. All those in favor? Motion carries 7-0. Uh, Diane, thank you so much for, to you and your team. Um, and I know we tried to have the community um, group put together and, and thank them for the help that they did give for the few meetings that they were able to attend. So um, this was not easy and I know it's not. And from here on, it's continued to be uh, issues for you, but thank you for all you do. We really appreciate you. <clears throat> Thank you. I have I have a great staff that has um, assisted with this process, and we've all worked really hard um, with with HR as well. And thank you guys for the support of um, doing the compensation adjustment in the budget. I know um, during difficult times that was a bold, you know, a, a very supportive decision. So thank you. Thank you. Move on to item J. Act on the donation to Grapevine High School, Dr. Ryan. Yes, the GHS uh, Tennis Booster Club, uh, always supportive. And uh, uh, this evening, they're donating a metal and fabric shade structure along with concrete slab to support that structure that's going to allow uh, uh, six metal picnic tables to be an anchored under the structure out there at the tennis center. You painted red, the, sh uh, the shade fabric will be blue to match the existing structures that are there. Uh, and so, uh, of course, uh, uh, other folks will be able to use that as well uh, that are in that area like uh, uh, the, uh, the ag students and the uh, band students and other folks that are in that area. Uh, so the recommendation is for the Board of Trustees to accept the donation of a metal and fabric shade structure and concrete slab to be installed at GHS Tennis Complex valued at $31,158. This is from the GHS Tennis Booster Club. Oh, thank you, Dr. Ryan. I just lost video too. Um, thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? Mindy. I move that we accept Dr. Ryan's recommendation. Thank you, Mindy. In the second. Jesse, thank you. I any, second. Any uh, questions? Mindy? Just a thank you. That is an incredibly generous donation and will be well appreciated and used. Yes, that is true. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you to the to the tennis team, tennis booster. Thank y'all very much. Move on to item K, act on recommendation of TASB official delegate designation, Dr. Ryan. Yes, only board members of the TASB active members, public uh, schools and uh, uh, service centers may serve as delegates or alternates. And uh, in each region, they meet with TASB directors to discuss issues critical to public education. Uh, and uh, so tonight we have the recommendation. It's for the Board of Trustees to approve Lisa Pardo as GCIC's official delegate and Jorge Rodriguez as the alternate delegate for the TASB Delegate Assembly. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion? Jesse? Yes, I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation. And a second. I'll second that. Doug, thank you very much. Any questions? Jesse? Uh, yes, I just would like to go on record that I've done a fantastic job in the past several years as the official delegate to the <laughs> delegate assembly. And so, Lisa, don't mess up. <laughs> Pressure's on, Jesse. 
Thank you, Jesse. Uh, uh, you'll do a great job. Just kidding with you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Becky? Yeah, just the only other thing I'd say is that the um, the LAC will be meeting again um, um, Friday. And I think they'll even be selecting their four LAC representatives and um, firming up the advocacy agenda. So basically getting ready for the ratification of that um, uh, in September or October, whenever, whenever we're going to have a convention. <laughs> September. Look like. October, but, October. 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 Yeah, yeah. So, and hopefully we'll be all in person at the at the KBH. But um, so they're they're getting ready for all the delegates to show up to to continue the work. So I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? I'm gonna see before I took a vote if I could get um, Jorge back on. I think he got off. <laughs> Maybe he didn't want to be. Yeah, he probably doesn't want to be the alternate. <laughs> but we can't hear him object. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go ahead and move for a vote. Um, all those in, all those in favor. And I don't know, Jorge can hear me. If not, Jorge. He, he dropped. He did drop. So motion carries six zero. I guess now's not the good time to tell. I guess I can because Jorge's not on. I'm not going to be able to make it. <laughs> <laughs> so Jorge is now our delegate. <laughs> yeah, you can tell him we all voted. Uh oh, here he, and here he comes. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> you missed the vote, Jorge. <laughs> Congratulations, uh -oh. Jorge. Congratulations. <laughs> We move on to item L, discuss current year performance of optional flexible school day program and approve the TEA OFSDP application for the 2020-2021 uh, school year. Dr. Ryan? Yes, this is a, a yearly requirement for uh, those campuses and we have several that have a non-traditional schedule for students. Uh, and so uh, I will allow uh, Dr. Schnauts to give us a little bit of a uh, background on this, and then I'll provide the recommendation. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ryan. So trustees, if you remember in years past, we had a, a public hearing uh, on the OFSDP performance uh, that was required. Now, that is not required anymore. However, it is required that you review the current year performance of the program, uh, and then you vote to sub subsequently uh, or to approve the subsequent plan for uh, for the OFSDP. So uh, prior to you voting on the 2021 plan, uh, I'm going to just give you some background information on the 1920 performance of our OFSDP. So first of all, the optional flexible school day program is a program in which GCISD offers flexible hours and days of attendance for students. Uh, is authorized under Texas Education Code Chapter 29, Section 0822, a student is eligible to participate in, in an OFSDP under the, the following stipulations. If the student is at risk of dropping out of school, the student is attending a school implementing an approved innovative campus plan, the student is attending a school with an approved early college high school program designation, the student is attending an online dropout recovery education program, the student, as a result of attendance requirements, will be denied credit for one or more classes in which the student has been enrolled. And last, the student or parent agree in writing to the student's participation. So I'd like to direct you to, I think it's page 49, the spreadsheet uh, that shows our numbers for the 1920 year. Just a couple of things. Uh, I think as you heard me say that one of the, the bullets was uh, the, the student is attending a school with an approved early college high school program. Obviously, Collegiate Academy fits the bill for us. Hence, you see the 62 students in our OFSDP. And those were our seniors who were participating um, in the OFSDP that needed a flexible schedule because most of them work. And uh, this really provides some, some relief and flexibility for them to maintain a job, make some some money, but also pursue and fulfill their academic requirements there at Collegiate. Um, and so we were able to uh, graduate all 62 of them, which is always the goal. 
Uh, but Bobby, uh, you know, Bobby Knuch uh, speaks very highly of just her kids having that flexibility and it just offers tremendous support for them and their families uh, as they, um, you, you know, complete their, their um, requirements there at Collegiate. I will say this, that you look at typically the Hope Academy and the Panther Academy will have maybe six to eight a year uh, in those. And, and so in reaching out to uh, both high schools, those students this year uh, went to Bridges and, and they took the, the path of Bridges. And so that's why you only see the, the one student there at uh, the Hope Academy at Grapevine High School. Um, if you remember last year, we included Bridges this year because Lindsay was wanting to try to do some innovative things with her scheduling. Uh, however, she said that didn't quite, um, you know, her students didn't, um, it, it didn't, weren't, weren't as open to uh, that innovative um, uh, scheduling and, and they chose to stick to the traditional bridges schedule. However, we did have one student uh, who was um, who happened to be uh, age 21 who really needed to, to work and, and needed that flexibility. Um, the one thing I want to go back to, though, is is to be in the OFSDP, the student or parent uh, agree. They have to agree in writing. And so the parents have to agree to allow their students to participate. That was also a hurdle. Uh, Lindsay shared with me that many of uh, her her students and their families just wanted them to to stick with the the bridges schedule of acceleration and you know uh, let's let's make up some credits and let's let's get you graduated. And so um, it, it is a great program to have. Um, and and if you remember back, we had to bring Grapevine Middle School uh, back kind of after the initial approval because we had an extenuating circumstance that really helped a student out. Um, and, and I want to thank you for that. And because of that, we are now including all of our middle school campuses on the application for 2021. Uh, we're not thinking we, we will necessarily need it, but we, we want it to be available just in case. And so that way we won't have to, to kind of bring it back ret retroactively. And so um, it's, you know, it's pretty cut and dry here. Um, We've we've used it for a number of years. It is used uh, extensively across the state and other districts, and it just provides the flexibility needed for for students who, um, you know, need to uh, go to school and also work and provide for themselves and for their families. Um, so anyway, that is for the uh, 1920 performance, um, and so I'll I'll kick it back to uh, to trustees to Dr. Ryan for any questions. I will say um, as I mentioned. I believe it's appendix five that's a replacement page. Thank you to Kim for providing that to the trustees um, that you will see all of the middle schools included on appendix five. And so just in case you see that and go, well, why are our middle schools here? And anyway, it's just just kind of a, you know, kind of a safety just just in case we have those extenuating cases. Thank you, Dr. Schnatz. The recommendation is for the Board of Trustees to approve the TEA Optional Flexible School Day Program application for the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? I, rec I, recommend we, I make a motion we accept the superintendent's re recommendation. Thank you, Doug. In a second? Becky, thank you very much. Second. Do we have any uh, questions? No? Seeing, seeing none, all those in favor? Oh, there we go. Uh, motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much, Dr. Schnauz. That is, that is uh, it for the action items. The remainder items are all information only. Uh, so we'll move to item M, um, update on the 2016 bond program. Yes, uh, Paula is uh, out of town at this time, and so I believe Gary is going to uh, join us and uh, share with us uh, the update of the uh, 2016 bond program. All right. Uh, good evening. Dr. Ryan, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. Good evening, trustees. Uh, Dr. Ryan, it's uh, great to be back with you. It's uh, kind of limping along without my person over to the left that I look at uh, for a confirmation of everything I say, but I know she's probably listening. So Paula, we miss you. Um, so we'll start off. Um, Kyle, do you want to, you want to bring up the presentation there or is it something? Yeah, you should be able to share on your side. Share, share, share. There we go. At the very bottom. <laughs> Hmm. 
A preview? No. Is it the preview? You should see at the very bottom looks like a square with an arrow pointing up. It'll say like share content. Right, right. Yep. Um, do you have that? Do you have that presentation? No, I don't have the presentation. Okay. <laughs> well, Dr. Ryan, I'm sorry we got a little mix up here. I, I thought I'd shared that presentation with you, Kyle. Um, so we want to do this. You want me to, I can send it and we can come back or let's see. If he sends it to Kyle, would that work? Yeah. And yeah. then we'll just come back to you. Gary, go ahead and share it or send it. Yeah, just email it over to me, Gary. Okay. Where, where's Paula when we need her? I know. <laughs> No vacations for Paula. Uh, no, no more. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, it's coming your way, Cal. <laughs> so, this is kind of an awkward silence. That's okay. Um, you doing okay, Gary? Things are things are going okay. Yeah, um, it's uh, believe it or not, still pretty busy, and things in the construction world and really on the design side are are um, staying fairly busy. So we've um, I was going to kind of mention this at the end, but we've we've started to um, gather the GCISD Huckabee team for the 2021 summer uh, projects. So uh, we've been meeting. We've had a couple of meetings internally. Um, and so we're going to send the team now out. Now that uh, summer is really upon us, we're going to send the team out to uh, really walk the scope items. It's kind of what we do on each of the projects is we take the bond spreadsheet and we just go line by line by line. And we walk those and see if those, you know, because some of these some of these line items were uh, really developed five years ago or so, you know, and so we want to see, are they still relevant? Do we still need to do them or do we need to to add to them in some cases, but um, so that's that's underway now. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, we ready? Yes, we're ready. Okay. All right. Well, we can click to the next slide here. We're going to start with the summer. Um, I don't know if you can put that in a presentation mode uh, for me, so we can see the. That do it. Yeah, that would do it. Yep. So we can go to the the third slide. We start with the 2019 right. uh, renovations projects. Okay. So uh, we'll start with Grapevine High School. And thank you for your patience, uh, trustees. Appreciate that. Um, we'll start with Grapevine High School. Just a quick update there. Um, the new fire suppression system that was installed throughout the building. We've been talking about for several months now um, will be complete the first week of July. Thank, thank goodness. Um, the testing for that is a pretty painstaking process um, that they will go through testing each zone, each fire panel, each sprinkler head. So that's, that's going to be ongoing. Um, that's really normally a, a tough thing to do with kids and, and staff in the building. So it's, it, it will go quicker than, than normal. And so uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, the gym floor, uh, the final installation of those thresholds, which really is, means kind of the, the end of, of really the intricate work, those are going to be completed this week. So those are the transition pieces between the wood through the doors into those various corridors um, uh, beyond. So that's, that's happening this week. Um, and then we're just uh, seeing a lot of cleanup for the bleacher. If you recall, we had to move the bleachers around to put in new flooring. Uh, so a lot of that work is uh, will be complete this week as well. And then the remaining work that they've, they've started to 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 hang the the wall pads uh, under each of the goals uh, along that in those entire walls. So that's that's happening as well now. Um, a couple of shots here just to the floor uh, finish. If you haven't been in there, it looks really really nice. Um, they've they've done an excellent job with uh, the final uh, clear coat finish and striping. Striping looks really, really good. So uh, next slide. 
A um, couple of shots here. One, one more on the left of the of the five. There's some some additional court striping that's going on there. They're uh, stenciling out for the letters on the right. I apologize for the. Uh, it's kind of a blurry picture, but what we're showing the stage floor uh, and the installation of the masonite panels on the floor. It got painted black the other day, and so these are just a, a fairly typical um, theatrical stage floor that that's gone down. So that's all new as well. Okay. Um, at Glen Hope Elementary School, um, what you see on the uh, uh, kind of a long time coming, the picture on the right, uh, but uh, a lot of progress here. So uh, the new windows are being installed um, along with the um, exterior rigid insulation. This is that that blue uh, piece of uh, uh, material there. And then the gyp sheathing and then the brick will go on uh, right after that. So a lot of scaffolding, a lot of work happening there to button that up. Uh, the roof contractor is going to follow that, uh, follow the mason with the extension of the roof tie-in, you know, as this tied into the existing uh, roof. So that's happening. Um, the exterior grading will follow uh, once the scaffolding comes down and that'll, that'll be uh, taken down by the mason. So that grading will start to button up that, that area really nice. And then finally, there are just some of the restroom tile work. Uh, ceramic tile uh, began last week on the 9th. Um, and that'll complete, and then it'll complete next week on the on or about the 21st. So, um, good progress going on on the 19 stuff. Uh, moving to the 2020 renovations um, at the, uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about the elementary schools first. But uh, a lot of the, the work there is happening simultaneously. Obviously, um, the flooring protection um, that's being installed, and the furniture moving process is taking place now. So. Uh, lots of work there going on with the ordering and the installation of of the furniture uh, as well. At um, at CHHS, the demolition has begun in the commons area um, and at the front vestibule. So there's just a lot of. I'll show you a picture here in a minute. There's a quite a bit of work going on there. It looks a little bit like a war zone at the moment. The locker room flooring um, also has been demolished. So um, also at CHHS, the gyms are current. Well, actually. The gyms aren't being sanded. The gym floors are being <laughs> being sanded. So that would be quite a feat to be sanding the entire gym. But uh, the floors are being sanded and should complete by mid July. So that's also a, a pretty painstaking process to make sure they're sanded properly and they get down to the right finish in preparation for the build back up of the clear coat finishes and the striping, et cetera. So uh, a lot, lot of a lot of good work going on there. Also at the high school. Um, the new HVAC chillers and rooftop units are being or they've been ordered and uh, we're awaiting a ship date. And I, I'll just add that um, those were meeting once a week with Lee Lewis and I they're just doing a tremendous job. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you. And, and so they're staying on top of these uh, order and ship dates and different things like that with materials. A um, little bit of a difficult time right now. We're having in some cases to adjust where. Uh, materials are being uh, made and ordered from. Uh, so we're kind of a lot, real, real care is taken to to try to stay local. Uh, you know, with just kind of what's going on in the world right now. So it's uh, they're doing a fantastic job of doing that. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and then finally, some of the framing on one side of the metal stud, the new wall partitions um, that will begin um, midweek. So next slide. All right, Kyle. There we go. There's a couple of shots here of the of the flooring. This is uh, post sanding operations, and so you see it's just kind of a really pristine looking floor. A lot of cleanup. Um, again, th there there's some pretty uh, pretty specific and high standards for for the uh, the cleanliness uh, and really the finish texture of that before they can start applying additional finishes and striping. So they've done a good job on that. And then this is the uh, the commons uh, areas, and you can see the flooring and the uh, is, is has been removed there. So um, uh, a lot of work then takes place next, really, to get those floors ready for new flooring. And you'll see here on the left and right uh, the entry com. You can see the the commons beyond on the right hand side picture, but a lot of the flooring uh, has been removed now, and they're just getting ready for for new flooring. So really good work. Um, and then we move over to the swim center. Um, the pool itself is uh, 
currently being bee blasted and recoded. So really what they do that if you remember last month, we, we talked about the pool being drained. Uh, the bee blasting process really is another prep um, operation for that floor to uh, to be recoded. And so that provides it some additional grip uh, and texture for the recoding surface. Uh, so that's happening. Work continues for the next three weeks in, in that respect. Um, all of the existing flooring throughout the, the rest of the building has been demolished and the new flooring uh, that's currently being installed throughout as well. So um, they've installed new air fans um, over the, the pool area that, that the bond called for as well. So that's operational. Um, all electrical panels are now installed. Uh, the rough end for the elect all the electrical runs overhead uh, to provide for new lighting and devices. Uh, will begin this week and um, some of the millwork installation uh, will also begin on the 18th. So a couple of shots here, you can see it's a highly, it's really unusual not to see water in that pool, um, but that's the process. And so it's, it's covered and protected. Um, it's a very sand, it's a very dusty operation when they bead blast and they, they get that uh, area ready for for the new coating. It's it's really dusty, and so you've got to protect it, and you got to protect all your HVAC ducts and different things like that. Um, a couple of shots more on the inside in the locker rooms, some floor prep work going on there, and then you can see on the right um, some of the uh, the uh, the fans that were installed over the over the pool area. So lots of work happening at the swim center. And then a couple of other um, GCISD projects. Uh, to talk about the administration building. Uh, just a quick update here. Um, the existing concrete floor slab is currently also being bee blasted after uh, removal of the floor finishes. It's um, it, it's kind of an interesting process when you think of the the, the work that went into that last bond program and, and so doing some new floor finishes there. Um, the uh, the demolition of the of the um, of the new floor plan layout in those certain areas is complete, and then the framing for walls, uh, et cetera, is is uh, uh, for that new layout. It's going to be begin on the on the fifteenth, really today. So, um, the rework of the existing courtyard um, has has now begun, and will continue over the next few weeks. So, just a lot of a lot of work going on there for waterproof weatherproofing. Uh, some of the grading in there as well. So lots happening there. Um, the backfilling around the exterior of the building, we've seen a couple of pictures uh, in the previous months, and that's now complete. Um, and then the sidewalk and paving work that's going on behind the building and that drainage flume and, and all of that drainage work, that's that's uh, happening now and it'll be completed this week. So I'll, there's a couple of shots here of the back side of the admin building, a couple of those uh, well, really, those are, are what I just uh, just mentioned there. So lots of grading and drainage work there. On the inside, again, as I mentioned, um, it, no flooring there, the, the removal of all the flooring and they're cleaning up uh, and really masking off some of those uh, cork board areas down the hallways and stuff for protection. They're doing a really good job with that and uh, starting to build back some of those walls. So. Um, and then I'll just briefly touch on the creek study work to, at Bear Creek um, that we mentioned last month, that ground penetrating radar work, that's now complete. Um, and so uh, the next step would be the geotechnical drilling uh, for for kind of that investigation of now what's down there. Uh, we And that's complete also, and we're, we're waiting for that report. So I should have more of an update for you uh, next month on that, and just really more of the findings there. Um, and then at Cross Timbers, the uh, the geotech drilling. Oh, go back. I didn't memorize that, Kyle. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you got me. The ge the geotech drilling is is complete, um, and the soil reports are now underway. Again, the reporting uh, usually follows a couple of weeks after the drilling. Um, and Pacheco Coke is our civil engineer. Um, will now do the survey of the site as we mentioned last month, and um, and then they'll come back with options. They'll create some options of, based on the findings, here's what we think. Uh, there's probably two or three different options to to look at there. So, so I think that's it now, Kyle. <laughs> so I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, again, I apologize for the mix up. That was, that was all my fault. So sorry about that. Not a problem, got fixed quickly. Do we have any questions? I, don't, I can't see everyone quite yet, so we'll just wait for just a second, Gary. 
Okay. Everybody. Well, did it come back? There we go. I thought it was my computer again. Do we have any questions for Gary? None. Gary, thank you so much. You have a good night. Rest right. of your night. Thank you. Appreciate good to see you. everybody. Thanks, Kyle. Good to see you. We'll move on to item N, 2019-2020 budget update. Uh, yeah, so uh, Diane, if you could take us through uh, the budget update that, uh, of course, trustees, this is for the uh, this current school year that we're talking about. Thank you, Dr. Ron. So earlier in the evening, we talked about the final amended budget. And what I want to talk about right now is the project projections on where I think we're going to end the fiscal year. And this is the last update that we will receive, and this includes 11 months of actual data. These projections do include the reduction in state funding um, for the CARES Act that we've talked about several times this evening. Um, but one other thing I want to talk about that's not reflected in these projections is the other pots of money that are going to be available to us to assist with um, COVID reimbursements. Um, so we have another pot of CARES Act funding that is going to um, reimburse the district for any type of COVID expenditures for cleaning, um, any kind of PPE we've had to purchase from the beginning of March through May 21st. So um, actually tomorrow is probably when I will start um, working on trying to figure out um, what those numbers look like and start working on filling out uh, the paperwork uh, to get those reimbursements. Um, the other pot of money is the FEMA money, which is going to be very limited for school districts. It's, it's um, they've, They've categorized the expenditures that will be reimbursed as only those that were for the safety of others. So it's pretty much going to be um, disinfecting things. Like we've purchased some misters um, and we've purchased some cleaning solutions. And so those are the type of things that um, we will submit to FEMA to be reimbursed. So I just wanted to let you know that those reimbursements have not been um, factored into these projections, which will actually help us. Um, if you look on page 66, um, this is just our typical um, uh, budget updates that we look at every month. Um, you have the final amended budget and then there in the green um, is what I have projected for revenues and expenditures. So um, my uh, projected revenues are about 136.6 million, which is very close to the final amended budget because as I discussed earlier, I, I adjust the revenue side of the, the budget. Then down below um, on the expenditure side, uh, I am projecting expenditures to be 137.3 million. Um, compared to the final amended budget, it's about a $3.9 million favorable variance. So um, overall, I am projecting that we would have a use of fund balance of $713,000 um, with an estimated ending fund balance of $56.4 million. So um, just keeping in mind that some of those um, COVID expenditures, which are about... 240,000 right now um, have not been factored into this, this use of fund balance. I will, I will say that I'm very thankful um, to have uh, the fund balance at this time when we have so many uncertainties, um, especially um, with next year. And as Jesse mentioned, you know, we may have to amend our budget. And um, so having that fund balance is going to be um, a saving grace um, for any of those additional expenditures that we have to incur. Any questions? Do we have any questions? I'm not seeing any. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Diane. We'll move on to um, item O, review owner contingency expenditures. Dr. Ryan? 
Yes, the board can see the published owner contingency uh, expenditures and I will be subject to your questions. Do we have any questions? Seeing none, move on to item P, review the 2020-2021 board planning calendar. Uh, you can just see a couple of changes uh, for June. You can see uh, one item is moved to July and one is moved back from July. Otherwise, there are no changes to the board planning calendar. Any questions, Jesse? Uh, Dr. Ryan, so, so if we look right above that at May uh, 2020, which were the election results and the oath of office and all of those, and it says postpone COVID, are those then just simply going to be moving over to November then? They're already. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And this is Doug. Uh, yes, Zach. I'm sorry. I was looking at the calendar. I'm sorry. Do we have the dates yet for the uh, meetings for next year? I have not seen those. For the meetings for next year? Yeah. Uh, yes, we do, and uh, we can put those in the board update uh, this week. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? None? Move on to item Q, request for reports to the board. Do we have any? None? Move on to the consent agenda for approval. Do I have a motion, Jesse? Uh, yes, I'd like to pull item N off the consent agenda, please. You say an N is in Nancy? Or N, N as in Mary. No, N as in Nancy. Okay. Any others to pull? None. Do I have a motion for other items? For other items? Do I have a uh, motion for the items A through P oh, with N oh. pulled? Okay. Jesse? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we approve items A through P with the exception of uh, item N for Nancy on the consent agenda. Thank you. In a second. Doug, second, any questions? All those in favor of items A through P with the exception of N, raise your hand. Okay. Motion carries 7-0. I did that backwards, Jesse, on you. I'm sorry about that. That's so okay. we'll go ahead, now we'll go ahead and pull item N. Yeah, and item N, I really just uh, want to use this opportunity for the minutes to reflect that I will be abstaining from voting on item N for Nancy. Okay. So we have item in the bid on the science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, instructional related services, equipment, and software. Dr. Ryan? Uh, yes, of course, this is uh, simply a bid uh, for these uh, uh, services, the recommendations for the board trustees to award the supplemental proposal for STEM, instructional related service equipment and software to Code with Kids, Moby Max, uh, Code Stream Studios, Workman Publishing, uh, Elementary LLC, Kinder Lab Robotics Incorporated, Kaplan Early Learning Company, uh, SAM Labs, and Pitsco Education. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? I move we accept Dr. Ryan's recommendation. Thank you, Becky. In a second. Doug? Doug's our second. Any questions? Seeing that, all those in favor? Motion carries 6-0, which is with uh, trustee Jesse Rodriguez abstaining. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Move on to announcements. Do we have any announcements? We've got training next week. We have um, summer, summer leadership next week. Hope everybody registered. Everybody's got that. Um, and also to remind everyone, I think this is a really thinking outside the box, the chef prepared meals. I think what a great partnership uh, between us and the foundation. Um, I ordered my first round. I'm gonna go pick them up tomorrow. I'll let y'all know how they taste. I'm excited. Um, but just what a great, uh, great idea. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Anything else? Do you have anything, Dr. Ryan? Um, not this time, no. Okay. Lou, thanks for hanging in. With us, I know that that um, twelve-hour drive home was not easy. So it's not, but it's good to be back. We we appreciate you, and I will let you know that the red strobe light has been quite entertaining. For the <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's the well, 
was he asleep? <laughs> Remember my wife redid this room and I didn't know it and put a different light bulb in this lamp and replaced the lamps. And so is yeah. it a, is it 182 <laughs> degrees in there? How? <laughs> Before I turned my camera off, I had to go turn the AC up because the AC upstairs has been off for a week, and I'm like, and you're just dying. <laughs> I'm sweating looking at you, Louie. I've, yeah. I've had to cover you up, Louie, because I just couldn't. I've, I've started laughing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I took a picture. Just wait till you see yourself, Louie. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, I just can't wait. Uh, I got you know, I, received, been, I have received a lot of text messages. That's the most screenshotted thing that's currently <laughs> online right now. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Oh, <laughs> for your entertainment Thanks, pleasure. Thank you for your for the entertainment, Louie. Oh goodness. We we don't have anything else to have a motion to adjourn. Jesse. I so move. Thank you in a second. Louis second. second. Thank yeah. you. All those all those in favor. Please Bye. no. Please no. This is too much fun tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the motion carries seven zero. Thank you guys. Y'all be safe. Good night.